and I should start streaming in just a second. And then we'll get started. Cool, cool. All right, I'm just going to close that down and trust that it is streaming without any issues. Okay. Um, I'm going to turn off my screen share for a second. Let's make sure it's still live. All right. Hello, everybody. My name is Paul, and welcome to so let me turn on screen one again. Uh, welcome to another virtual tech for teens. This one is intro to coding and video games. We're going to be looking at um, a software called Scratch, and hopefully you got my email. Um, I, I took the list of everybody who was registered as of like noon or something yesterday. So if you registered after that, you might not have gotten it. Um, but it just um, told you where to go to sign up for a Scratch account. Um, if you haven't done that, um, I'd recommend doing it right now. Sign up, create your own account. It's free. It's pretty quick. You just need an email address. Um, otherwise, if you don't want to create your own account, you can follow along and use the account that I'm going to be using, which is open to anybody, um, but you won't be able to save your work. Um, so just keep that in mind. Um, all right, so let's dive in here and start talking about what we're going to be doing today. Um, Tech for Teens, this is our last of the currently scheduled Tech for Teens workshops. We have um, more coming up, but we haven't put them on our calendar yet. Um, all of these workshops are available on our YouTube channel. If you want to go back and watch them, if you weren't able to attend, um, you can just search for Simon Pacer. This QR code right here will take you to the playlist of all our Tech for Teens um, workshops. So feel free to check that out. Um, and right now, um, we are still attend. We're still going to be planning on doing all these next ones coming up this summer. We're still going to be doing them virtually. Um, but coming back in person is on the horizon. At some point, we will be returning to in person tech for teens. Um, but one thing I've noticed is that we have a lot of people from out of state. So welcome if you're not from Minnesota and you've come to join us, fantastic. Um, one thing we've found is that we're reaching a lot um, wider audience by doing these virtually. So when we go back to in-person, um, we're thinking about also streaming the in-person workshops so you could continue to attend virtually. So I have a quick question for everybody who's watching this live on Zoom. If you're watching this as a recording or on YouTube, you won't be able to answer the poll, but I'm gonna set a poll here. Um, and which one do I want? I want the Tech for Teens one. It's a quick question. Um, so, and go, go ahead and answer that on your screen. When it's safe for groups to gather again, we're gonna start holding these in person, but I wanna know, would you still attend this virtually or do you prefer to do this in person? Um, either way, we're gonna do it in person, but I just wanna get an idea of how many people would be interested in this virtually when we start going back to, to in person. And got a lot of people voting here. Ah, oh, it's pretty, pretty split. And I understand the not sures because we don't really know what's going to happen with um, this pandemic. And we're definitely not going to um, start doing it in person until we're comfortable that it's safe for groups to gather and all that stuff. But um, split pretty evenly here. Um, wow. Okay, I'm going to end that polling so you guys can see it. Um, There you can see the results now, um, pretty, pretty split down the middle. Um, that's kind of what I was hoping. So I think that's, that's helping to confirm our answer that we're gonna broadcast these virtually even though we, when we start having them in person. So you can still attend even if you're from out of state or if you just don't wanna make the travel because uh, I know travel can be really difficult for, in, in a lot of circumstances. So anyways, um, I'm gonna close this out here. And thank you for that input. That is very helpful. Now let's go ahead and um, dive in to what we're going to do today. Um, all right, so here's the agenda. Um, first thing I want to do is talk a little bit about coding concepts. So, so this, this is our intro to coding. So if you're a complete beginner, um, Great, this is perfect for you. But if you have done some coding before, we're still gonna look at some pretty neat things um, and hopefully you can still um, create a pretty cool game and have fun with it. And, and of course, 
no matter how advanced or, or how beginner you are, um, whatever questions you have, I'll do my best to answer those in the chat. Um, so we're going to talk about some coding concepts, what coding is, um, and then we'll compare that to video game concepts. So there's a lot of areas that you can do coding, but we're going to talk about video games specifically because video games are cool. Um, then we'll dive in and we'll just start using Scratch and we're going to make a video game. I have a sample here so you can see the type of thing that we're going to make and I'll walk you through the steps and how to do that. You can follow along um, or you can just watch whichever you prefer. Um, we'll make this video game and then we'll open it up. I'll have some time at the end for you guys to ask any questions you want about this stuff. Um, there's also when you close out um, the, the broadcast today, um, there's going to be a, a survey at the end. And um, it's really helpful if you guys fill that out. It gives us an idea of who is attending these and it gives us ideas of how we can make them better. And one thing I'm looking for is ideas for new Tech for Teens workshops that we can do. Um, so if you've thought of any ideas that you'd love to see presented, throw them in that survey at the end. So you'll see that once, once this thing quits, you'll get a pop-up to click on that survey. So um, feel free to to check that out. All right, so let's dive in. I've rambled enough. Um, coding, coding. Um, now oh, we got a hello, hello, Heather. Welcome, welcome. Um, coding, if you've never done coding before, and it, or if you have, coding is a complex thing. And it is really a, a, a computer language. So anytime you do um, coding, you have to learn a specific language. And there's lots of different ones. Um, Java, Python, uh, C++, um, JavaScript. I mean, there's so many different languages out there. Um, learning all of them is near impossible. But learning parts, uh, learning a couple of them really well and learning parts of other ones really does open up a lot of options in the world of computer science. And I stand by um, I stand by saying that coding is one of the most important skills that you can learn no matter what industry you want to get into. You want to get into to art, you want to get into literature, um, coding can still be helpful. It can really streamline the things that you do. And so I really like showing things and coding and just getting a basic understanding can help you no matter what industry you want to go into as you get older. Um, but the thing about Scratch and what we're going to be doing, is something called block coding. And block coding takes the traditional text code that one would have to learn and it puts them into these different blocks. So um, like these, these different pieces each represent a line of code and you piece them all together to make a script that does something. Um, so what's great about this is you don't have to know a specific language to learn the idea of coding. So things like loops and um, events and if then statements, all those things that are complicated coding concepts that you have to learn a, a coding language for, you can learn the ideas using block coding before you have to learn, learn that language. So it's pretty cool. Um, there are some definite downsides to using block coding um, because it's entirely visual. So anybody out there who has any type of visual, visual impairments um, Scratch is notoriously bad for, for that because it doesn't work with screen readers. Um, but there are some tools out there. I've been looking a lot into different ways that, that coding can be taught and, and learned easily if you have visual impairments. So um, reach out to me at my email if you have questions about that. I had one person reach out about that. Um, I'd love to talk more about that. But for now, we're just going to stick to um, this traditional block coding using Scratch. Um, so these are the five things that we're going to talk about in terms of coding. Um, we're going to talk about what sprites are, conditionals, variables, loops, and event handlers. And if you have no idea what those things are, that's OK. <laughs> we're going to learn what each of those things are today through making a video game. So uh, the video game we're going to make is going to utilize all five of these concepts. And if you get one of them down, call that today a success. If you get all five of them down, fantastic success. Um, so we got another hello, hello. Um, so with a video game, there's lots of different types of video games out there. And the things that make video games is every video game has some sort of character, whether it's you yourself, whether it's, um, 
like Tetris, which is just like, you know, these little blocks that you move around, or if it's, you know, like a traditional Mario or, or something, or, you know, Minecraft, whatever, there's some sort of character. Um, and those are going to be um, our sprites, is what we're going to be calling them today. Um, there's also movement that you need to be able to control. If you can't control movement, you're not really playing a video game. Um, you're playing some other kind of game. Um, so we're going to look at how to control movement. And we're also going to look at how to automate movement. There's always going to be something that moves on its own. So if you think of Tetris, the blocks on their own always move down. You can move them side to side and spin them, but that's it. In Minecraft, there's all sorts of mobs and, and different characters that move around on their own. Um, and then the other thing is reacting to the environment. So if you bump into an obstacle, you lose points or um, you fall off a cliff in Minecraft, you lose all your stuff, you know, something like that. You have to react to the environment. And lastly, keeping score. There's lots of different ways to keep score. We're gonna do a pretty simple one in here so you can see how that works. So a little bit of math at the end. So I know we all love math. <laughs> um, I love math, I should say. All right, so let's dive in. Those are the things we're gonna cover. Um, oh, here I have those little comparisons, but I already talked about those here. Um, so let me just zoom on. All right. Um, yeah, we got some, I love coding. Fantastic. Um, hopefully we can come up with some pretty cool stuff today. Um, real quick, I'm going to bring this up here and make sure we don't have anybody missing out on this. Okay. Don't have any emails from anyone. Okay. So here's what we're going to do. Um, do I have an animation here? Yes, I do. Scratch. So right now, go ahead and um, open up Scratch. If you want to follow along and, and do this with me, um, open it up in a new tab. Now, if you have two monitors at home, that's fantastic, because then you can see me, what I'm doing, and your screen. If you don't have two monitors, that's a bit tougher. Um, and, and that's why I say open it up in a new tab so you can flip back and forth. Um, I might go too fast. I apologize if I do, but it is, it is being recorded, and you can go back and, you know, watch any parts that you missed and of course ask questions as we go that's the fun part about attending this live is you can ask me the questions um, so go ahead go to scratch.mit.edu i've already brought that up on my screen where is it hiding here here it is and this is the game that i created um oh oh the login if you're going to use my account um let me log out of here. I have to move my camera. Sign out. If you already have your own account, I recommend using your own account. You just go right here to join Scratch to sign up that way. Um, let me zoom in a little bit. There we go. Um, but if you want to use my account that I'm using, um, keep in mind everybody can see your work um, because other people have access to this. Um, but go into sign in and the pass the username is just tech for teens and the number one and the password is tech for teens and the number one. Um, so pretty, pretty easy setup. I think I have that right here. Yeah, there it is. Username tech for teens one password tech for teens one all lowercase and the number one. So if you want to use my account, you can. A nice thing about using my account is I can see what you're doing. Um, or as if you're using your own account, I can't necessarily see it, but that's okay. All right, so I'm going to sign in. And if we're going to start from scratch, what we would do, scratch, no pun intended, um, you would just go up into the top left and hit create. I'm going to show you what we're going to create though first. Um, because if you see this and you're thinking, wow, this looks amazing, then stay here. If you look at it and think, ah, oh, boring, and then maybe you don't want to. <laughs> don't want to put up with me for for an hour um well, let me show you how this works it's a pretty um basic setup um it's a i made it into a dinosaur game um i have a high score here and a score up in the top and i have a dinosaur that i can move around with my keyboard I just move them up and down left and right and he kind of animates a little bit um, i don't know if we'll have time for animation we'll see but when you start the game i hit space bar and this rock starts an asteroid i guess starts flying at the dinosaur and you just have to dodge it Pretty simple. Um, it just comes at you randomly. And then once you get hit, game over. And it tells you your score. If you get more than the high score, it'll give you the new high score. So it's a simple setup. But as we go through, you can see ways you can customize it and, and make it your own. Um, I chose dinosaurs because dinosaurs are awesome. 
Um, all right, so that's what we're gonna make. So we're gonna make this straight from a blank screen though. So I'm gonna go right in here into the create in the top left. And you can usually see that create right up there, well, no matter what screen you're on um, or how zoomed in you're in, I should say. And it creates a blank project and it gives you this cat as your character. And if you wanna use the cat, fantastic. You can use the cat. <laughs> um, uh, but I'm gonna go ahead and use that dinosaur again. But um, before, uh, where do I, oh, I have to zoom out, I think a little bit here to see the name of this. I think I'm good. All right. So as we go through here, here's how this works. If you've never used Scratch before, um, it's, it's pretty, it's both simple and complex. So you can use it in a very simple way or you can get crazy complex, which is kind of cool. That's which is why it's great for lots of different users, um, advanced users and beginners. And so how it works is you're creating code to move and, and interact with things on this stage on the side where this cat is. And this stage has um, coordinates and wherever you put your characters or your objects, you can see their coordinates down here. So right now it's at 15, x15, y5. Put it up here. Um, it's at uh, x negative 83 and y 180. So this box, um, this box is uh, 400 pixels by 400 pixels or 400 points by 400 points. So this all the way to the right is positive 200, all the way to the left is negative 200 all the way to the top is positive 200 Y and all the way to the bottom is negative 2,200, 200 Y. Um, I don't know why I said thousand, but those coordinates are really helpful. We're gonna be using that a little bit later, but this is your stage and all your different characters and all your objects go right here on the stage. But right here, this blank space in the middle, that is your workspace. And that's where we're gonna put our code. In this case, it's our blocks of code. And on the left are all our different types of blocks. So they're separated by category. So they have different colors, motion, um, which controls how it moves. You have looks, which control you know, how things look. So there's different words and things that you can like thought bubbles you can have pop up. There's even sounds. We're not gonna mess around with the sounds, but, but there, that is an option. You can record your own voice and have it play. And, and so it's kind of neat. Um, events, control, sensing, operators, variables and then the my block is something if you wanted to customize your own block we're not going to get into that but we're going to be using every every category in here except sound today we won't be using that but we'll be using all the rest and i'll show you quickly how it works so if i grab this first motion one it says move 10 steps so i'm in the blue section and i'm just going to drag it onto our workspace now nothing happens but when I click on this, when I click on move 10 steps, this cat is gonna move 10 coordinates to the right. So right now it's at X22. So I'm gonna hit this once and now it's at X32. And I'm gonna click it again, X42, 52, 62. And it just keeps moving by 10 each time I click on that. And if we turn this into a negative number, so negative 10, you can just type right into there, then it moves backwards, negative 10, so nine, negative one, negative 11, negative 21, negative 30, and it just keeps moving backwards. Um, and that is essentially how it works. But um, each of these blocks can be pieced together like a puzzle. So one thing that we can do is, the first thing we're gonna see how to do is control these characters. I'm just gonna do it really quick and then I'll get my dinosaurs out and do it with that one. But if we go into events, so events mean something happens. Um, in this case, there's things like when the, the flag is clicked or when the space bar is pressed or all these different events that can occur. I'm gonna use this one, when the space bar is pressed. And it works just like a little puzzle. I attach it right to this. Now I've created code. Um, now what this is saying is when the space bar is pressed, then move 10 steps. So now if I use my keyboard, hit space bar, the cat moved 10 spaces to the right. And I keep doing that and our cat is moving. And just like that, we've created code um, to interact and control the movement of our character. Um, simple as that. 
So we're going to do this to give it a little bit more control of our different characters, but I want to keep looking at what um, Scratch can do. So this, I'm going to get rid of this code for now to get rid of it. If there's any piece you don't like, you just throw it back over here and it disappears. That's, that's how you get rid of those. Um, well, this cat, if you want to use this cat, fantastic. You can use that cat. Um, I'm going to zoom out a little bit here so you can see the screen a little bit more. But down here in the bottom right hand corner is your sprite option. So you can choose your characters, your objects. And I'm going to go ahead and get rid of our cat. So I'm going to hit the trash can right next to our cat sprite right here. And then I'm going to go into the sprites. And there's a couple of different things. You can um, choose a sprite from any of their choices. Scratch it has a whole bunch. You can paint your own, which is kind of cool, difficult, but cool. Um, you can have a random one, or you can even upload one. So if you have a picture of a character that you created, or you want, you had a picture of like Mario or something, um, you could upload Mario and have Mario in your game. Um, you, you'd have to have a picture of him though. Um, but I'm going to go into here, choose a sprite, the little um, magnifying glass, and they have all these different sprites to pick from. Um, the one I chose was just this dinosaur one, and I'm going to choose them, Boop. and there we go. We got a dinosaur on screen. And so just like that, feel free to go through here. You can choose any of these sprites you want. You can draw your own. There's that cat again. Um, but notice they don't just have characters like people and animals. They have objects like here's a donut, drum kit, earth. Um, I don't know how they came up with these different characters, but they're just simple graphics. So you could make your own um, if you wanted to. and and upload it by going, oops, oops, I clicked that too many times, by going down here and choosing this upload, but, or you could even draw your own right here. So you could actually draw something out using this paintbrush. Da, 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 da. And now you have that crazy shape on there. <laughs> um, let me go back to my code. But now look, I have two objects. One of them is this crazy purple shape that I created. I'm just gonna get rid of that. I'm just gonna trash it, make sure I keep my dinosaur. All right. I'm going to move my, my thumbnail is in the way. If your video is in the way, um, you can move the, the video window. My video, I guess, is in the way. But this dinosaur, he's too big. Um, I mean, dinosaurs are pretty big, but he's too big for our scene. And there's a bunch of different ways you can shrink them. But the easiest way is clicking on them. And then down here, there's a size option. It's at 100%. I'm going to shrink them down. We could put them to 50%, you see it gets pretty small. Yeah, that's too small. I'm gonna go 60, there we go. Uh, you can choose any size that you want for your characters, but that's the quickest way to shrink your character. Um, so, so now we've got our character. You can choose any character you want. I wanna start with the first task of is, is controlling the movement. That's the, the, it's a pretty simple code, but we're gonna do multiples to control different directions. So I'm gonna start with the thing that we just did a moment ago where we moved him to the right. We did that with the cat. To do that, I'm gonna go into motion and I'm gonna grab move 10 steps. I'm gonna drag it into here. And if you can't see this, you can zoom in a little bit. So you do have the zoom to make these things a little bit bigger. Um, I'll do that on the screen so you guys can see it a bit better. Um, but we need something to control it to tell it to move 10 steps to the right. And that's under events. So when an event occurs, this one that we chose is when space key is pressed. I'm going to drag that onto there and plop it right on top. But this time, I'm not going to use space key. If you'll notice, there's a little drop down menu where it says space. And when I hit that drop down menu, um, I have all these different options. I can choose any letter or number. Um, or I can choose um, the arrow keys or this any key. So any key that you press does something. So I'm going to use the arrow keys. If you're a gamer, you might want to use WASD for your controls, but I'm just going to use the arrow keys for those of us who maybe aren't gamers. I am, but keeping it simple. Um, and so I'm going to go to um, right arrow. And now when I hit the right arrow on my um, keyboard, it moves to the right. Simple as that. And that's all the code we need to move him to the right. I'm zoom out a little bit. Now to move him to the left, 
we're basically going to do this exact same thing, only we're going to have it be the left arrow. And instead of moving 10 spaces, a positive 10 direction, we're going to move in the negative 10 direction. Um, and so to do that, I'm going to bring this thing back down, another one. I'm going to choose left arrow. I'm going to go back to the motion section. And this move 10 steps, I'm going to drag that right here. But I have to make sure to change this 10 to negative 10. Now, right arrow moves it positive 10, left arrow moves it negative 10. And just like that, I have some control of left and right. Pretty slick, pretty slick. I like it. All right, I'm going to move these guys out of the way. And now we have to do up and down. Now I'm just doing up and down. I don't want to do like a Mario game where he stays flat on the ground and then he has to jump. That actually is a lot of advanced code involved in it. And we'll do, we'll probably do a more advanced version where you can see something like that. But I'm just going to keep this person sort of floating uh, up and down. Um, so to do that, to get him to go up and down, there there is a special item for that. And if we go to the motion section, it's down under right here. Change, oh, there it is, change Y by 10. I'm going to drag this out here so you can see it. And zoom in a little bit. Change Y means change this Y coordinate. So those of you who love math class and have done graphs before, Y is the vertical axis. axis. So, um, changing the y coordinate makes them go up or down. So that's what this thing does. Uh, a positive 10 will make it go up, a negative 10 will make it go down. So just like we did up here, we're going to grab an event, plop it on here. But for a positive 10, which is up, I'm going to use the up arrow. And then I'm going to grab one more here. Let me scroll down a little bit and choose down arrow. And I'm going to go back to motion. Grab this, um, change Y by, and switch to negative 10. And there you have it. Um, we have up arrow, down arrow. Let's test it out. Yep, up goes up, down goes down. I do have to hit them individually. If I hold it down, it'll work, but there's kind of like a little delay. So it's not a perfect system. There are some fancier codes you can get to make a move a little bit smoother or a little bit quicker. And actually, if you wanted them to move quicker, anybody know what we could do? Um, you change this number to a bigger number. If we change that to 50, check it out. Boom, 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 boom. He moves way faster because he jumps 50 spaces at a time instead of 10 spaces at a time. If you want him to go really slow, <laughs> you can switch it to one. And let's check this guy out. Oh, man. I'm going to fall asleep at this speed. I like 10. 10 is a good round number to work with, but that's one way you could very quickly change the speed um, to make it faster or slower. Um, we got a couple questions here. Is there an attendance certificate after this webinar? Um, typically, we don't do attendance certificates um, because this, you know, this is just kind of a, a fun thing for teens. But if you, if like, your school wants a certificate or something like that, you can do that. I know sometimes there are professionals that tune into this virtually. Um, um, if you're looking for something, you can reach out to me and I can maybe create one for you. Um, and then we have another question that just says 60. Um, not sure what the 60 question is from June. Um, but yeah, as far as the certificates of attendance, attendance, we don't typically do that. And yes, it's being recorded. Um, so, uh, so yeah, you can always watch this afterwards if I'm going too fast or, or review this. Um, I'll also send out a follow-up email um, with all these scripts. So if you don't remember what these are, and you just want a copy of that, all these scripts are going to be in there. Um, so, so keep that in mind. If, if you're like trying to write these down or something, don't bother. I'll send out the, the follow up with all of these scripts. So you can make reference to that. So there we have it. Oh, oops, we've done our first thing, which is just control movement. And the next thing we're going to do is we're going to automate movement. So I had that rock that comes flying across. Um, and let's do that next. All right. So I'm going to go back into my sprites, my choose sprite. And I'm going to do this search one because I'm going to look for that rock to send across the screen. 
And I'm going to click on that. And let's go control some. Where's our rock? Um, I suppose I could have searched. Here we go, rocks, it's called. It has a little extra rock in there, but I'll show you how to adjust that. I'm going to click there. There's our rock. And check it out. Now I have these two sprites down in the bottom. And the code that we just did only applies to the dinosaur because we only put it on the dinosaur's code workspace. When we click over to the rocks, there's no more code there because we didn't make any code for the rock. And that's important to know because we don't want the rock to move when we hit our left and right up and down arrow keys. So the codes for each object are completely separate. You can have them interact with each other, um, but they do have to do separate, separate uh, scripts for each sprite. Um, and that's essentially, that's how Scratch is designed. Um, and that's also what you would do for any traditional video game. Each of your different objects are gonna have their own separate lines of code. Um, all right, so I'm gonna move this guy out of the way and click on our rocks. There we go, and move them right about there. Now, the first thing we wanna do is we wanna get this rock to soar across the screen. Now, uh, what we saw is when we push a button, it moves 10 spaces at a time. So let me bring up that code again. I'm gonna do space key and motion 10. Now we want the rock to go to the left. So we're gonna to have to change this to negative 10. But now let's check this out. I hit space key and it just moves a little bit. And I have to keep hitting space key. So that's not automated movement, that's manual movement. I have to keep pushing that button. Now, if I say, well, maybe I wanna jump it all the way across, so, you know, let's go negative 200. Now that, Still, it just jumps all the way across. It doesn't glide across. Um, there is this glide option that you can use, but I'm actually not gonna use that. I'm gonna use a different concept so we can see how this would work in a traditional video game. So what we do instead is we, we do something called a loop where we loop this action. So basically, in order to get this thing to go all the way across the screen, I have to hit this, oops, wrong one, uh, space bar. I have to hit this repeatedly. And we want code to hit that space key for us. In other words, to do this action again and again and again. And so that is under control, the, the orange section here, so the light orange section. There's this repeat option. And right here, there's this forever repeat, which would do exactly what it sounds. It would repeat forever. And it just keeps going and going. And we run out of room, so it stops right there. But the code is still running. We can see it's, it's still lit up right here. Um, so right now, my code is out of control. And so to stop it, I'm going to hit the stop sign right there. Boop. And so we don't want this to repeat forever. There are situations where we might want to repeat forever, but we don't in this case. So I'm going to put get rid of this forever. See how I kind of did that? I just have to take each thing apart piece by piece and then throw this over here. What we want is we want this repeat, this repeat 10. And how we do it is we take the move and we put it inside this repeat. So now it says repeat this action inside it 10 times. And I'm gonna attach it to here. Now we have the beginnings of some more complex code. So when the space key is pressed, repeat this action 10 times. So let's check it out. There it is, it plays it really fast, but see how it jumped it across 10 spaces, 10 times, that moved it 100 spaces. Now, if we want to go all the way across the screen, we're going to have to do this more than 10 times. Um, if we do um, 40, that should give us 400 spaces that it goes across. So let's check this out. Boom. So there it went. Didn't quite make it all the way. Um, so let's, uh, let's bump it up to 45 and hit space bar. And that's pretty good. You know what? Let's just do it. Let's just do 50. Let's just do it. <laughs> there it goes. Bam. That looks pretty good. And so just like that, we have created some code to get this thing to jump all the way across the screen on its own. But anyone see the problem yet or what we need to do next? So it shot across the screen just fine. But then once it gets there, it stops. And that's it. We need this to go back to its original starting point. We need it to come back here and start again. 
So to have it come back is kind of an interesting thing. So first thing to do, we move this rock to where we want it to come back to. So I want it to come back to right about here. And look at these coordinates that the rock had. Let me write right about uh, there. The coordinates here are x252 and y56. So if we go to the motion section, because this rock is currently in the place that we want it, those coordinates show up right here in this block called um, go to x252 and y56. If we move this rock, check it out, those coordinates change, 64, 88, they match whatever the coordinates are here. So if I put it right here, where I want it, so right about there, then this block of code has those coordinates built into it. And I can plop it right here. And now what our code's gonna do is it's gonna shoot across the screen, repeat 50 times. And then at the end of this code, when it's finished repeating 50 times, it's gonna go to the next line of code, which is go to this position. So it's gonna jump back to, to right over here. So let's hit the space bar and check it out. And boom, jumps right back to there. Perfect. So that's exactly what we want. Let's try it again. Spacebar and boom, goes right back to there. Fantastic. And each time we hit spacebar, it starts again. So there we have it. Now we just have one last thing to do. Well, I actually have two things to do, but the last thing to really get this automated, notice each time it's done, I have to hit space again. And in our game, it just kept coming kept coming from all sorts of different directions, but it just kept coming. So that's where we go to our control and use this forever loop. This is where the forever loop comes in handy. Now it's tricky to attach this forever loop because it's gonna go all around, wrap itself around everything. So let me grab this here. And I have to take this whole block right off and plop it right inside the forever. So now the forever is wrapped around the entire thing, your entire code. So in other words, it's going to do this code again and again and again forever. Well, let's check it out. So it goes across, jumps back, goes across, jumps back. And there we have it. We now have our automated movement. And it works in conjunction with our um, dinosaur movement. It doesn't yet uh, interact with our dinosaur. We don't have that code in there yet. Um, but it's now moving on its own. And so we've almost have our rock done, almost done. Now, right now, this is just going to keep going. If you want this to stop playing, I, I mentioned it a moment ago, but you can hit this stop sign up here. So if you ever write code that messes up and everything's going haywire, you can always hit this stop button right here and it stops all the code. Um, there's also a little trick I like to do um, that I'm going to show you right now. It's for something called debugging. So it's when everything gets out of control. If you don't want to have to go up here and hit this stop sign, you can actually create some code so that pressing something on your keyboard stops everything. It's, it's not something you have to do, but I think it's really helpful to have. It's kind of like a fail safe button that can be really helpful when you're designing code. And you can get rid of it when your game is done, but when I'm developing code, I like to have this, some sort of fail safe so that everything isn't going all haywire, a force quit, if you will. And to do that, I'm gonna show you really quick how to make it, and you don't have to do this part, but it's kind of nice because you can always use the stop sign. Um, we're gonna go to um, events. And it doesn't matter which sprite you put this on, but when key is pressed, I'm not gonna do space key. I'm just gonna use the letter Q for quit. Um, there's the letter Q right there. And under control, there's something called stop all. And you notice there's a drop down menu. You could do like stop the scripts, other scripts, whatever, but I'm just gonna stop all. And what that does is every single script, every line of code that's running, um, this action stops it. So now anytime I hit the letter Q, everything will stop. So let's check it out. I'm going to start the program. Now it's running, it's repeating, it's doing its thing. And now I'm like, all right, I'm ready to quit. Boom, hit Q and it stops. Um, so that is a really quick bit of code that you can do um, to just stop everything and get it all kind of reset, if you will. Um, 
I do one last thing to this though. Um, but instead of just having stop all, I like to get my rock back in its starting point, which is this code right here, this go to X, Y. So check this out. I can right click this go to X, Y. I can duplicate it. And then I can drag this and put it right in between here. So now what this does here is when I hit Q, not only does it stop everything, it does put our rock back to its starting point. So let's test this out. All right, everything's going haywire. And it's like, ah, my code isn't working. I need to quit. Boop, I quit and our rock goes back to the starting point. Nice little quick tiny script that you can do. You don't need it. You could just have it had it stop and you can drag things manually, but it's a fun script to have there to gain some control as you're experimenting with, with the code on here. All right, so um, let's look at the next thing. Um, so right now, um, this rock, if I, if I, here, let me quit to reset it. If I play this, it's not gonna be a very hard game. The way it's coming from the exact same spot, I just moved my dinosaur down and bam, invincible. Um, so really to make this more of a real video game, we need this rock to not always start here. We need it to come back to some random location. So instead of coming back to right here, maybe it comes back up here, maybe it comes back down here. And so we never know where it's gonna be coming at us. And so to do that, Q, um, we're gonna use something called a randomizer. And we're gonna put it right here where this go to X and Y are, see these coordinates? Um, we can randomize those numbers. Um, and specifically, we just want to randomize the Y. Um, because the X, we always want it way over here. We want that X to always be way far to the right. But the Y, we want it to start from anywhere vertical. So this coordinate, this 59 in our example, we want that to randomize each time. And this is a cool feature. So over in the green section, this is the operators section, there's a pick random one to 10. And see how it's kind of rounded shape? That means it can go into any place that has a round um, space for it to fit in. And I plop it right over this 59 and boom, it's now picking a random number between one and 10 instead of just doing 59. Now one and 10 is not a big enough range. Between one and 10, it's, it's basically gonna be like right here in the middle or something. Um, uh, like right there is where it's going to always be. So what we want to do is we want to choose this range by, um, let's see how high can, or let's see how low we want it to go. Maybe about this low is the lowest we would want it. So that's negative 119. Let's do negative 120. So we, from range negative 120 all the way up to how high do we want it to go? Maybe about here, uh, right about there. Uh, 169, let's do 170. So I'll do 170. Now, each time this resets, instead of going right back to the middle, it, it picks one of these random numbers. So I'm gonna hit Q to get us back in the middle and let's check it out. Shoots across, there we go. Now it's coming at random places. And notice we didn't do too much different to the code. All we did is change that, that return location of point fit you know, that 59 coordinate to just be a random number using what's called a random number generator and if you are doing code for a traditional video game there's a lot of uses of random number generators in fact some people have made their whole careers on creating random number generators um, in this case this random gen generator is just a single block of code which makes it a bit easier for us to incorporate it into the big picture so there you have it. I'm gonna go ahead and hit Q to stop this. Boop. Stops everything. See, isn't that nice? I don't have to hit the space there, this thing. That's why I like this little code. You don't need it, but it's kind of cool. All right. <clears throat> so that is just about it um, for, for you know, control and automated movement and things. Um, I do wanna mess a little bit around with the appearance of this to make this look a little nicer. Um, so let's check this out. If we go to this rock, I'm gonna grab our rock and see how there's kind of two of them right there. In my example, I just had the one. Well, with the rock selected, there's a tab way up in the top left called costumes. 
And under there, you can mess around with the way this thing looks. And if I, and I wanna be careful, I don't wanna paint anything. If I choose this arrow and I can select different parts of the rock, including, look at that, it's its own separate piece here. I can just hit delete and now it's just one rock. Every single um, sprite that Scratch has created in their database has this sort of interactivity where you can mess around with it. If you are using your own, you, you maybe wouldn't have such easily um, take apart <laughs> pieces or separate, separate pieces that you can just sort of delete. You'd have to kind of draw them your own, but this is nice for the examples. So that's one way I can quickly mess around with that um, under costumes. And while we're talking about costumes, um, if we click on the dinosaur to see the dinosaur's costumes, you'll notice the dinosaur actually has four different costumes. And the purpose of these costumes is to, um, is to use animation. So in the example that I did, each time I hit you know, left or right, it would switch to a different costume, giving that illusion of, of movement, giving that animation. So when I hit right, it would switch to this costume and then back. Um, or it would switch to that one and then back. So it kind of made it look like he was running. So there's a code in there um, to, to animate that, which we'll look at at the end, but that's what these costumes are for. Um, so I'll, I'll hold off on that till we get to the end to make sure we have enough time for it. But in the meantime, I just wanted to show you how that rock appearance worked. And I'm gonna just click back to our code section and go from here. All right. So the next thing to do, um, I see we have a question in the Q&A, the dinosaur is getting hit, but nothing's happening. That's because we haven't coded an interaction. So that's the fun thing about coding. And sometimes maybe the frustrating thing about coding is every single thing that a video game does has to be coded, like everything that it does. Um, in this case, the movement all across, the movement back, the interactions between them, everything needs to be programmed. Um, and so to do that, we need to put code either on our dinosaur um, or on our rock that does something when they interact, when they touch. And I'm gonna go ahead and put this code on our rock. Um, and I'm gonna zoom out here and I'm just gonna move our cue out of the way. We don't really need that. Um, just, I'm gonna keep it on the board, but I don't wanna have to look at it. So what we're gonna do now is when the space key is pressed, um, it does all this code to control the movement. Now, if I wanted to, I could keep adding more code into this section to do all these more fancy things, but that's gonna get jumbled really quick. Sometimes there's benefits to that, sometimes not. I'm actually gonna create a separate block, just like we did here. We made a separate um, script, I guess you could call it. I'm gonna do a separate um, group of blocks right here that controls how it interacts with our dinosaur. But what's interesting is under events, if I use space key as the event for this line of code, then both these lines of code will start at the same time. There's nothing that says I can't put two of the same events running two different types of code. So it's a, it's a great way to kind of merge those together without actually having to merge them together, which can make it a lot easier to see what you're doing. Um, so I'm gonna create this when space key is pressed, not only will it do this line of code, it's gonna do this line of code that we're about to make. So what I want it to do is when this thing touches the dinosaur, I want the game to be over. I want everything to stop. Um, <clears throat> and so to do that, <clears throat> we're going to have to do <clears throat> something in the light blue section called sensing. Under sensing, there's this thing called, you know, touching and touching a color and distances and when things are pressed. So it's all, it's trying to, it's, it's its senses when it's interacting with different things. So this touching one is the one that we want. And I'm just gonna drag it here. Notice it doesn't just attach right here. We're gonna need some other code to put this in. But also it says touching mouse pointer. That's not what we want. In the drop down menu, there's this. Check it out. Dinosaur one. That's our dinosaur. 
Um, so now there's this touching block, but we need to put this inside something because it doesn't attach to this thing. Let me move this guy out of the way. Bring this guy over here. I'm gonna zoom in so you can see a little bit better. Boop, boop. Um, and that's under um, control. Under the light orange section of control, there's this cool block, um, if then. So if statements are like the, the essential piece of knowledge for computer science. All our computers, everything that we do runs on series of if statements. Um, some of them very complex, um, but that's, this is like the basics. If you can understand if statements, then you have the beginnings of coding down and you're, and you're ready to move on to, to advanced coding after that once you really master if statements. So what this says is, if something happens, then do something is essentially what this is. And note, look at the shape of this. This is the same shape. It's this um, hexagon, just like our, our touching dinosaur block is, which means this can plop right into here. Boop. And we can attach it right onto here. And now um, when the space key is pressed, it's going to check for something. It's going to check to see if our rock is touching the dinosaur. And if it is touching the dinosaur, then it's going to do some sort of code. And the code that it's going to do is stop everything. Um, so if we go to our control again, stop all, check it out. We can plop that right in here. And it stops everything when it's touching the dinosaur. So if, if you don't see anything wrong with that, we can test it out and see if it works. Um, and go, I'm going to tell you right now, spoiler alert, it's not going to work because we need to add one more thing, but let's check it out. I'm going to hit the space bar and it's not doing anything. Our, our rock is still moving, um, but it's hitting the dinosaur and it's not doing anything. Anybody know why? You don't have, if we were in person, you know, I'd have hands going up and stuff like that. But I'll tell you the reason for it is because this code, that our touching dinosaur code, um, just ran once. Whenever code is running, check this out, like this one is running, it's lit up, which means it's now running that code. But this one stopped. That's because when I hit spacebar, it checked to see if the dinosaur was touching and it found that it wasn't, and then the code stopped. So what we need to do, cue to quit, we need this code right here to just keep running constantly. We want it to always be looking for the other, to see if it's touching the dinosaur, not just run it once, because um, when I hit spacebar, it wasn't touching the dinosaur, so the code quit. Um, we want this to always be running. So under this, we're going to use this forever. We're going to grab this whole block of if touching dinosaur, plop it inside the forever loop, and attach that onto here. Now, let me move my dinosaur out of the way. When I run this code, this code keeps running, and now it works. And see, just like that, everything stopped once it hit my dinosaur. So that forever is really important. Um, it takes, you know, code is very literal. Um, it, it doesn't know what you're trying to do. Code only knows what you're exactly telling it to do. So it's really important to um, be diligent about everything that you're adding into your code. So in this case, let me hit Q to reset. It's running that again and again. And as soon as it hits, the dinosaur anywhere, it stops the code. Um, the last thing we're going to do with this, um, before we put a background, because we have someone asking about backgrounds, we got to do that as well. Um, but before we do that, I want to do one last thing with this rock. So notice when it hits the rock, everything stops. Well, that's kind of boring. I also want it to say game over. And in the example that I did, the rock is what said game over. Um, and so what we did for that is we use costumes. So I talked about costumes a little bit ago. That was foreshadowing for this next step. With the rock selected, if we go over to costumes, what I did is I duplicated this rock as is, that's normal looking rock. I duplicated it here. So under this one in the top left, I right clicked and duplicate. But on the duplicate, on this rocks two, it's now called, um, what I did, if I zoom out a little bit here, there we go. I added some text just right above it. So there's this text one, and let's change it to red. There we go, really brighten that up. 
and I just said game over. Go back to my arrow and I can straighten this out. There we go. Well, now it says game over. That looks a little bit nicer. At least it's telling us something was happening. Um, but you have to be careful here because now if I run my game, we'll go back to the code and I hit Q to reset and I hit space. But look, it says game over. <laughs> um, that's because our rock is currently set on costume two, it's called. And go back up to here. There, now I got rid of that. So what we want the code to do is when it runs into our dinosaur, that's when we want it to switch to this costume too. It's called the second costume. And I'll show you how that code works. So back under code, boop, um, with this code right here, see how when it's touching the dinosaur before we stop everything, we want to switch costumes. We want it to say that we want it to be the game over rock, not our regular rock. So costumes is under looks, the purple section. And here it is, switch costume. And look, it already says rocks two in there because that's one of the costumes that we, uh, that we created. I'm going to plop that right above stop all, right here. So it only goes off if, the, uh, if it's touching the dinosaur. Then it will switch to that costume, stop everything, and we should be good to go. So I'm going to reset. I'm going to start this off, and let's see if it works. Hit our dinosaur. Boop. Game over. So it worked. Um, and now you may think that's it, <laughs> but check it out. If I start this game again, it still says game over. <laughs> um, so what we need to do is we need something that will reset this back to the original costume. Somewhere after this code runs, we need it to, to reset. And what better place to do it than when we hit space key. So when we hit the space key, when we start our game, we want that game over to be gone. So I'm going to do switch costumes again. I'm going to put this right. The very first thing we do is see how I can slip it right in between here. And instead of switch costume to rocks two, I'm going to do just the original rocks. Now, when we hit space bar, boop, that's gone. It switched to its first costume, which doesn't have game over. And only when it hits the dinosaur does it switch to costume two. Um, I, I reset this here. Let me see here. Quit. And when I hit space bar, boop. It gets rid of that. Another thing I could do, I just realized as I did this, when I hit Q, it still says game over. So if I wanted to, instead of putting this under the space bar, um, I could get this out of here and I could put it up here when we hit Q, um, if you remember that code. So if you created this little, um, this fail safe thing, this reset button, I guess it kind of is, um, then it would do that. So if I hit Q, boom, that's another way. So that's one way we could, could reset it. Now we don't have to worry about it saying game over then. Let me hit that. When I hit Q, boop. So yeah, you could put that kind of anywhere. Just make sure you put it somewhere so that when you begin the game, it no longer says game over. We have to switch back to that other costume it's called. Um, and we have a question. Did you notice that when the rock hits the dino, you can't see his face? Yeah, it depends on where where it hits the dino. Yeah, where it hits it. I did notice that. Um, all right. The the last thing here, not the last thing, but the next thing then to do is we had a question about what about the background? Um, backgrounds. There's some really fancy things you can do with backgrounds. Like after you hit a certain certain score, it can switch backgrounds, like going to a new level or something like that. But I'll just show you how to get the original, just one backdrop in there, and and that's right here. And on the stage section, it's called. We have one backdrop, but right here, I can choose different backdrops. I could even draw my own, or I could upload one. So if you had a picture, you could upload a picture, and that could be your backdrop. You could take a picture of um, your house or something, and this thing could all be happening in front of your house, you know, whatever. Um, but I'm just going to choose the magnifying glass and look at their examples. And you know, they have you know different cities and canyons. And here's my Jurassic one that I chose. I'm going to use that for this example. But you can go through and pick anything. Dinosaurs in the city. Oh man, jungles. Now I'm going to do Jurassic here. Boop. And just like that, it pops that background into there. And um, there is a line of code. We're not going to do it today, but there is a line of code that says switch backdrop. 
So using what you've learned today, if you wanted to do, have something, some interaction that switches the backdrop, you could use this block right here to have it switch to different backdrops. So you'd have to load different backdrops in. Um, let me go back to there. But that's, that's a piece of code that you could use if you wanted to do that. Um, <laughs> we have a question. Can you add blood when the rock hits the dino? Um, that's kind of violent, but yes, yes, you could. Um, I'm not going to do it here, but I'll show you how. Um, when the dinosaur, so you would basically do the same code under the dinosaur of when it's touching the rock, switch costumes. And then on the second costume, you could have like, a, you could, <laughs> you could have like blood splatters or something. Oh man, this is so violent. <laughs> but, but yes, that is something that you could do. Um, any type, type of animation. You would just have to put in this code that when the rock is touching the dinosaur, so in the dinosaur's code, switch to that costume that you that you added the blood to. <laughs> so thank you for that question, Thelma. <laughs> um, but yes, that is technically something you could do, but I'm not gonna do it. I, I, I want it to be a, it's just a gentle tap of my dinosaur. It's, it's not the extinction yet. It's not that extinction level. <laughs> All right. So um, back to our rocks, we have our backdrop. Um, so I think we've, we've just about done it here. We've got, um, we've got this animation, we've got that game, or, oh, I gotta switch my dinosaur back to his original costume. Um, I think the only big thing that we're missing is, um, Q, is uh, score. We gotta keep score as the next thing to do. Um, Hey, perfect question. How are we supposed to do scoring? Fantastic question. Um, that's what we're gonna do next. So let's go back to code. And this is to do score. How I wanted to do score is I wanted to get one point every time we dodged a rock. So as the rock went by, if we successfully dodged it, that's one point. So since it involves the rock, we would probably wanna put our scoring code inside the rock itself. And, and not bother putting it in the dinosaur. Um, so the, the perfect line of code to use would be this one here. Um, the, one, the first one we did that controls its movement. And basically what happens is if, it is if it runs into the dinosaur at any point, everything stops and it's not able to do this last line of code where it's supposed to go back to a random place. But if it gets to this line of code, that means it didn't hit the dinosaur. That means you successfully dodged it. And that means if it's going back to the starting point, it should be adding some score. It should be counting that. So the code that we're gonna do is gonna add score um, right after it does this thing or, or right before, I suppose. And to do that, we need to create a variable. A variable is something that changes um, with time. It's, it's variable. Um, so what we're going to do here is there's the, the dark orange section called variables. And there's one that's just called my variable, but I'm going to make a new one. You could use my variable if you want, but I'm going to do a new one. And I'm just going to say, what's the name of this variable? I'm going to call it score. And it works for all sprites, which means it's always visible. And I'm going to hit OK. And now I have this little guy called score. And as long as it's checked, it shows up on screen. Uh, now, we could, we could have called it anything. We could have said, you know, whizzle wazzle and had that in there, whizzle wazzle, but that doesn't make any sense. Um, and I'm going to go in here and how do I delete a variable? Delete whizzle wazzle. I just right clicked it and deleted. But anyways, um, so I have that checked and now we can see score. And right now it's just zero. And it's going to stay zero. Like if we, if we ran this code right now, I scored a point but it's staying zero because we haven't told the game what to do with this variable yet. It doesn't know that it's a score. We have to tell it what to do. Um, so I'm gonna hit Q to reset. Here's the code. We have these couple of things, set my variable to, change my variable, show my variable, all those different things. What we want is this change, change my variable by one. So we're gonna grab that. We're gonna put it right in front of this go to, position here. So in other words, 
it successfully made these 50 steps to the other side of the screen. So that means that the rob or the, the dinosaur dodged it. So we're going to change the variable by one, but not my variable. That's this one right here. We're going to do that to be score. We want the score variable to change by one. If that's confusing, you can delete this one called my variable, um, but but we want the score to change by one each time that runs by. So I'm going to move my dinosaur out of the way and let's run this and see if it works. Oh, I wasn't fast enough to get more than one, but we can see there we go. We got one. And I'm going to reset boop, and let's start it up. But oh, look, our score is at one still. And now it's going up to two. So there's one more thing we need to do. Um, let me uh, reset this. Look at that. It's that each time I play the game, that variable, our score, is where it left off. So not only do we need to add the score by one each time we get a point, when we restart a game, we need that score to reset. And so the key, the button that we've been using to reset the game um, is this, this cue. If you have this in here, this could be a great reset button to reset the score. Otherwise, when you start a new game, when you hit the space bar, it could go in here. But basically, we use the set my variable to zero. Um, and I'm going to go ahead and plop this um, right here. Boop. But not my variable to zero. We want to switch score to zero. So I hit that drop down menu and switch it to score. Now when I hit Q, not only does our rock go back to its starting point, our score sets at zero. And now let's check this out. I oh, wasn't fast enough. Let me hit Q to reset. Scores back to zero. Um, alternatively, you could have put that. Let me take this out right here on the space key. So the first thing that happens when you start a game is it sets the score to zero. Let's see what that one looks like. Um, all right, still, still getting a score. Boom. But when I hit space bar, I got to reset. It starts back to zero. So um, that way you can look at your score for a little bit. And then when you hit space bar, that's when it resets. Bonk. Cool. So that's you can pick and choose how you want to do it. I'm going to have my score right here under the queue. But you can put it anywhere just as long as it's resetting before your game actually begins. And that is your score. The last thing we need to do, let me reset. The high score. Here's where we get math. So, who loves um, inequalities? For those of you math folks out there, inequalities are basically checking if something's greater than another thing and, and all that. We're going to use inequalities and if statements. And so, here's where it is. Um, here's what the code's going to be. And I might as well put it in the rock. Um, so, we're going to make a new variable called high score to keep track of whenever that score reaches that high score, we want to save that. So I'm going to make a new variable. Boop. I'm going to call it high score. Doop, 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 doop. OK. Now, there we go. We have high score, 0. Now, the, when we want the high score to be recorded is whenever our score becomes greater than the old high score. So right now, the high score is 0. But once this hits 1, we want our high score to change. So here, here's that um, here's the code. Under control, there's an if. I'm going to pull this right out here. And we're going to use the operators, the green operators section. Because in there, we have these inequalities. See, we have these less than, greater than, and equals. Um, we want to use the greater than. I'm going to grab this out here. So it says, let me zoom in a little bit more so you can really see this guy. So it says, if greater than, we just have a blank and we have 50. Well, we're going to replace that with something. We're going to place it with our variable. So under variables, and see how this, this sort of oval score, you can actually drag that right out and plop that right in there. Now it's checking to see if score is greater than 50, but we don't want it to see if it's greater than 50. We want to see if it's greater than the high score. So I'm going to grab the high score and plop that right over on top of the 50. There. Now our code is checking to see if our score is greater than the high score, 
Then what we want to do, we want to make the high score equal whatever the score is. It's kind of a dizzying logic here, but like if the high score is 10 and suddenly we get a score of 20, well, we want the new high score to be whatever that score is because it's greater than it. That's the new one. So that's what we're going to do. We're going to take this thing right here. We're going to set high score, not to zero, but we can grab this score again and whoop, set to score. And the only time we do that, the only time this code will run is if the score, the only time this script right here of changing the high score to score will run is if the score is greater than the high score, the old score is, is uh, greater than the, than the high score. But now we need to figure out where do we put this? What, where in our sequence of things do we wanna plop this guy? And some of you might know, and what we're going to do here is right after this, change score by one. Right after that is where we're going to plop it. So I'm going to put it right into here. Boop. So let's see how it kind of shifts that go to X and Y. Now it's going to change the score by one. And then before it does anything else, it's going to check to see if score is greater than high score. If it's not, it just goes on and starts the next loop. But if it is, it's going to make our high score, it's going to update our high score. So that's some complicated stuff, but if you got it to work, let's, let's check it out. Let's see if it works. I'm gonna move my dinosaur out of the way so I can make sure to get at least one point here. Um, now I'm gonna hit start. So I got one and look at that, our high score changed. All right, game over. I'm gonna reset and now look, our score reset to zero, but our high score is still two. So I think I can beat it. Let me hit uh, start here. There we go, come on. All right, I got it, I got it. Three. Oh man, my high score. I'm dominating. Can't be stopped. Too fast, too fast. Woo. <laughs> All right. I got a high score of seven. Um, now, if I reset this, there's my high score now. And just like that, we have created um, a pretty basic game, but with the beginnings of everything you need for a video game. This is, this is the stuff that you need. I'm going to zoom out here a little bit. Um, and that's, um, that's all there is to it. So these are the main things that we were going to show today. These are all the coding things that we were going to do. Since we do have some time, um, I, I think we're just scheduled to 1130 today at 1130. I'll, I'll stop the YouTube broadcast, but anybody who wants to stay on zoom and ask questions, you can, you can do that. Um, but since we have a little time, I'm going to add one more thing here, and that's our animations. So when we move our dinosaur, it looks pretty boring. The I mean, dinosaur just sort of floats and is like a statue. Um, what we want to do, I want to do something is every time I hit the key, I want the dinosaur to, to move, like actual look like it's running or walking. And so under our dinosaur code, that's where we're going to do this. There we go. So each time I hit the right arrow key, I kind of want it to jump forward. So we're going to put it on this code, the right arrow key. And to do that, we're using costumes. So what's nice about the, the characters that were created by Scratch, they have these pre-made costumes. If you upload your own, you have to make these different um, costumes for them. And a costume is just it can be like that. It can be a literal costume where their clothes change, or in this case, it's just a different position that the dinosaur is in. So this one, it looks like a good one. So each time I hit R, I want it, or each time I hit uh, um, arrow, I want it to leap up like that. So this is um, costume four. It's called dinosaur one D. See how there's the letter D there? That's the name of that one. So let's go back to our code. I'm going to switch this to dinosaur a go to our code for our dinosaur and i'm gonna kind of move these let me zoom out a little bit i'm gonna move this out of the way so we can see i'm just gonna mess with this one for now and looks looks is where we're gonna go and there's a switch costume item so each time i hit the right arrow i want it to switch costumes and i'm gonna plop that right here and 
if I do that, if I just do this, it's not going to be quite what we're looking for. As I hit the right arrow key, it moves to that costume, but now it stays in that costume. So what we want it to do is I want it to switch that costume and then switch back. So it gives that kind of motion. So I'm going to do switch costume again underneath the move, and I'm going to switch it back to dinosaur A. And now let's see what this looks like. Now, it's not quite there, you'll notice. Let's see how it looks like nothing's happening. The reason for that is this code runs at the speed of a computer. And so it's happening so fast that we're just not seeing that motion. It's, it's going up and down, it's doing this, going 10 steps and doing that so quickly that we can't see it. So what we need to do is we need to have some sort of pause before it switches back. So we can actually see it switch to that first costume. And so that's right under control. Lots of crazy things, huh? Um, under control, there's this wait. Wait one second, and you can change that to anything. But if I put that right here, I'm gonna put it after the move. Now it's important to put it after the move because if you have to wait one second before it moves, it's gonna react really slowly. Um, and I don't want one second. I think I'm maybe gonna do 0.5 seconds. Let's see what this looks like. So that's, so notice it's, I can still move this way, I can still go up and down, but it's a little bit slow because it's running this thing for, for half of a second. So I'm gonna make it even smaller. Let's go uh, 0.25, quarter of a second. And that's pretty good, but it's still just too slow. So I'm going to go even slower, 0.1, a tenth of a second. Let's see how that looks. Now we're talking. And that's how we can get that animation to make him moving forward. And that's it. And then you could do the same type of thing with the other costumes here. So like for the left arrow, um, what are the costumes were there for this guy? This one where he's kind of looking backwards. You could try that one. Let's check it out here. So I'm going to do... What was that costume? That was costume B. So I can do the same code we just did. I'm gonna do looks, let's say switch to costume B. And I'm doing the left arrow, because remember the left arrow makes him go backwards. Um, I'm going to go to control and I'm going to wait for 0.1 second. I'll move that up there so we can see it. And I'm going to, after that 0.1 second, I'm going to switch back to costume A. Boop. Let's see. There we go. Oh, man. <laughs> looks pretty goofy. <laughs> it looks real goofy. But I mean, those, those are the animations that are built into it. So um, that might be kind of a new way to kind of duck. You can have like a duck button. That might be kind of cool to, to help you out. Um, so they would think the dinosaur looks silly. Yes. Yes, I think the dinosaur looks silly. I, I agree with you there, um, but it's kind of fun. And you can use different characters. <laughs> There's different dinosaurs, different shapes. Um, if we wanted to get really, I'm not going to do, I'm not going to do the bloody thing that Thelma asked. Um, but what I will do is I could show you, like when the rock hits it, I can have the dinosaur react to that, um, and and that code would just be when the space bar is pressed. I'm going to do it kind of fast here. Um, because we're kind of at the end here. When the space bar is pressed, um, I'm going to go to control and forever. I want it to be checking to see if it's touching the rock. So if, and then under sensing, where's that touching? There we go. Touching. We're going to change from mice pointer to the rocks. I told you I was going to go fast. Sorry. If it's touching the rocks, then we want it to switch costumes. Switch to costume. Where's the one that looks like he got hit? This one. <laughs> it looks like he kind of got hit there. So that's costume C. So I'm going to switch to costume C. Boop. There we have it. And now <laughs> let's check this out. All right, let's get hit by this rock. And bah, there he's kind of all mangled now. And as soon as I start hitting this, he goes back to normal. So I don't need a reset because it resets when I use my arrow keys. But let's uh, let's run this code again. I want to see that one last time. 
<laughs> you could even do a sound effect like that if you wanted, but um, that way you'd have to add sounds in there. But there we have it. Um, that's everything. That's all the code that I wanted to do. Um, I just I just realized that um, for some reason I'm not signed in. Um, and so everything that I just made here isn't going to get saved. Um, if you were doing this without signing in and you wanted to save your work and you realized, oh, I'm not signed in. I did all this work. Nothing's being saved. Um, quick way to do that. You can actually download this code um, and then upload it to, to an account later. And because I didn't mean to make this mistake, but it's a nice thing to learn if you ever do this mistake. Um, I have all my code. It's looking great. I want to save it. If I go to file, I can do save to my computer. So I'm going to hit save to my computer and see how it kind of just downloads that right there, scratch project right there. I think it just went to my downloads page. Now I can go sign in. Um, tech for teens, let me sign in. And oh, well, well, it saved it. So I guess I didn't have to do all that. But if it didn't bring that in with it, you would go to file. Um, load from your computer and you would just find that. So here it is, um, unti yeah, untitled scratch project. You load that in there that way. Um, but this case looks like it just, as soon as I signed in, it saved all that, which is kind of cool. So if you're signed in, you can change the name right here. Um, Paul's, what is it, April? April Dinosaur Game. You can call it anything that you want, really. Um, if you want other people on Scratch to see it, or if you want to share this, which I would love to see it, you can hit this orange share button, boop, and now anybody can see it, um, and you can copy this link right here, you can email it to me, um, you can send it to your friends, anything like that, and now anybody who, who's on Scratch can, can see it. Um, so I'm going to go see inside here, go back to there, and there we have it. So that's everything I got. Um, I'm going to go ahead and stop the broadcast on YouTube. If you are watching this as a recording, feel free to reach out to me with questions. Um, you can reach, you can email us directly at stc at pacer.org, um, or you can email me. I'll be sending out an email reminder to everyone who is, um, or a follow-up email to everyone who registered for today. So just give me a moment. I'm going to stop sharing my screen. Uh, stop share. Oh, I got big. And I'm going to go ahead and stop the live stream. So if you're watching this as a recording, I'll see you later. But everyone on Zoom live, you